Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar, OSHA's Top 10, an analysis of the most cited um, OSHA violations in 2018. My name is Nita, I'm with the Triumvirate Environmental Marketing Team, and I'm going to be your moderator for today's event. Before we get started, I'd like to give you a brief overview of what this webinar is going to entail and run through a few housekeeping items. Everyone's mics will be turned off for the entirety of the webinar. Please use the questions tab in your webinar panel on the right of your screen to communicate and ask any questions. Any unanswered questions will be followed up with after the webinar in the coming days. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Mark Liffers. Mark is the practice director of EHS Consulting for Triumvirate Environmental, where he provides on-site technical service support and outsourced program management to a wide range of technology-based research, manufacturing, and construction clients. His areas of technical expertise include biosafety, industrial hygiene, occupational health and safety, radiation safety, construction safety, risk assessment, EHS auditing, and emergency management. Mark has a Master's of Science degree in Industrial Hygiene from the Harvard School of Public Health. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Mark. Oh, hey, thank you, Nita, and uh, welcome, everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure to uh, be speaking with you all. And uh, apologies if, uh, if I'm a little clumsy with the slides. I have a sticky button on my, my laptop, so uh, uh, if, if we have a hang-up, it's all on me. But anyway, what I wanted to do today is, is talk about the uh, OSHA's current uh, top 10 uh, areas of, of violations. These are the regulatory compliance areas that OSHA sees most commonly. Uh, we'll look at some of those. We'll look at the OSHA regulatory agenda uh, for 2019 and uh, 2020. And then we'll talk about some recommendations for uh, avoiding citations. And uh, Nita, if you could help out a little bit with this, we also have a poll question and uh, would like to ask people how prepared you think you are for your next OSHA or equivalent state OSHA inspection. Oh. And Nita? <laughs> yes. Hang on. There we go. Oh, it looks like the poll closed out before we were uh -oh. able to hear it. Um, so do we want to skip this poll or what do you think, Nika? Yeah, maybe let's skip it because uh, we're having some technical difficulties with the poll right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, apologies for my, for my sticky button. But uh, anyway, let's, let's get into the uh, regulatory update. We'll talk a little bit about OSHA. And, and I think you guys know uh, OSHA uh, applies to basically private sector. For public sector employees, we typically have uh, an equivalent state agency that needs to be as effective as OSHA uh, and uh, basically deliver the same uh, regulatory programs. So as we can see, um, and these are you know the latest data we have from OSHA. OSHA has been working on some uh, beryllium and uh, respirable crystal and silica standards. Uh, crystal and silica comes into play because we have a lot of folks that are working with concrete, uh, coring, drilling, uh, grinding, which uh, can get us into the respirable uh, crystal and silica uh, zone. Uh, occupational illness. Uh, data, uh, if you have a facility with more than 250 people subject to OSHA, we, uh, we are filing those records electronically now, and there's been some new rulemaking to uh, eliminate personally identifiable information from that. Uh, we have additional um, rules for certification of crane operators, uh, really applies uh, primarily in construction situations, and <clears throat> we're working on additional rules for communication towers with all the cell phones that we have. Communication towers are, are everywhere. Uh, also, uh, similar to that, uh, windmills for power generation. Uh, OSHA is working on, on uh, rules for that. Emergency response and preparedness updates to that. Mechanical power presses affects primarily manufacturing folks. We do have some uh, machine shop uh, impacts with that. Powered industrial vehicles. Uh, lockout tagout. This is a, a fairly significant topic for facilities-related operations. We have uh, HVAC equipment uh, that typically needs to be locked out or tagged out for service. Uh, going to be some updates for that. 
uh, some groundskeeping tree care standards in the in the preliminary stages uh, that we have. And again, of course, our crystalline silica uh, is going to be tweaked for a, a, a while, we would suspect. And out on the horizon, um, some more amendments for, to cranes and derricks, a little bit more work on beryllium, uh, crane operator qualification for construction, uh, cranes and derricks. Uh, uh, Puerto Rico is getting brought back into the fold, uh, some updates for the state plan there. And then how is OSHA going to be tracking all these workplace injuries and illnesses uh, since we're submitting them electronically? So that is all stuff that's uh, uh, going to be impacting us. Um, and it's uh, basically in the rulemaking stage now. <clears throat> Respiratory protection is going to get some amendments. And <clears throat> we're, OSHA is working on technical corrections to a number, a uh, big number of OSHA standards and regulations. So uh, these are the types of changes that we're going to be seeing uh, in the next couple of three years. OSHA still does not have a uh, uh, an ergonomic standard, um, but there are going to be some uh, requirements to uh, record uh, these types of injuries, uh, infectious diseases, process safety management, and uh, again, ladder scaffolds, uh, other types of fall protection in shipyards. So these are some long-term, uh, several years out actions that OSHA is involved with. What's OSHA been doing about penalties? Well. Um, I think, as you all know, OSHA has been increasing its fines. Um, we are in the fourth straight year of penalty increases uh, to compensate for inflation. And right now for 2019, a, uh, an other than serious violation could be uh, as much as $13,260. Uh, failure to abate, if OSHA comes in, um, identifies an issue, uh, requires that 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 uh, violation be abated, we can get an, another $13,260 per day fine uh, beyond the abatement, abatement date. <clears throat> and for those willful or repeated, those egregious violations, that, that fine is up to $132,598 per violation. So if you are cited by OSHA for something, uh, they come back in, they find that it has not been abated uh, or it's a repeat in another area, uh, we could be fined as much as that. So these fines are getting larger and larger, and they are uh, being increased, uh, again, to track with inflation. States that operate their own occupational safety and health plans uh, are required to adopt these penalty levels so that they are at least as effective as federal OSHA. So uh, if you're regulated by a state entity, uh, these are the penalties that could potentially apply to you as well. On the enforcement front, and OSHA's data is, is a bit old. We only have complete data through calendar year 2017. Uh, through 2018, it's, it's a very similar uh, number of inspections. In 2019, it's still tracking the same. But we had a little over 32,400 uh, inspections, site inspections where a person showed up at a regulated entity. Uh, the vast majority of those, over 21,000, were the result of a phone or uh, fax complaint directly to OSHA. Typically, it's a phone call to OSHA. And as a result of those inspections, OSHA issued almost 60,000 total violations. Uh, again, these are the, this, this is the 2016 number, 2017 and 18. I've, I've seen the preliminary data on those, and it's very, very similar to that. And uh, you can look at those enforcement summaries on the OSHA website if you're interested in them. But what were those violations uh, all about? Well, this is where we can get into the, the top 10. <clears throat> and for our most recent complete year, our top 10 regulatory issues that OSHA saw were uh, fall protection, hazard communication, scaffolding, respiratory protection, lockout, tagout, ladders working at heights, powered industrial vehicles or powered industrial trucks, uh, training requirements for fall protection, machine guarding, and personal protective equipment. Year after year, these have stayed very, very similar uh, as far as 
violations. We see a little bit of shift. Um, you know, something might be number seven this year. It was number six last year, but but by and large, these these track very very similarly year after year. <clears throat> so general requirements for fall protection um, this year, we had. Uh, excuse me, for 2018, we had 7,200 violations, um, primarily under the construction standard. And I think we all know that OSHA requires that we have fall protection wherever we have someone working at an, at an elevation, an unprotected height or an unprotected fall uh, potential of, a, of four feet in general industry or six feet under construction. So if I have a loading dock or a, a raised platform, in my facility um, and I could fall at least four feet from that, I need some form of fall protection. If it's under, in a construction environment, we were at, allowed to add another uh, two feet to that. Where do we get our guidance for these? Um, this series of, uh, uh, of requirements, uh, the ANSI standard um, for fall protection really identifies uh, personal fall arrest systems, uh, lanyards, uh, harnesses, uh, retrieval devices, uh, positioning systems, and, and rescue uh, equipment. And let me back up just a little bit. Under fall protection in uh, um, a typical, oh, if I'm looking at a typical higher education uh, environment, uh, my main concerns are going to be uh, people up on a roof uh, inspecting or servicing uh, typically HVAC equipment, maybe fans and motors for ventilation systems. Uh, I need either some sort of a railing uh, at the roof line to protect people from, from, uh, from falling. I could use a, a harness and a tie-off system. I could use a warning line. Uh, or a, uh, an attendant on the roof to watch people. So we have a number of ways that we can provide fall protection uh, for people on roofs. The other place that we see a lot of um, issues are typical mezzanine areas, uh, areas used for storage, uh, warehouse areas, uh, shop areas, uh, where I have a, a sump or a pit, uh, I may have a fall hazard there. So these are the types of areas that, that we need to, uh, to look at. And I think we should all know what a standard uh, uh, rail system is, uh, basically uh, 42 inches high with a mid rail and a tow board uh, that can withstand a, a horizontal force of at least 200 pounds. So that's that's the type of fall protection that we're looking for. And don't forget your uh, <coughs> um, skylights on roofs as well. Uh, they need to be either protected or the skylight itself needs to be designed uh, to support uh, a load, and I think it's it's uh, uh, of at least 250 pounds. So um, that's that's the type of thing that we can the, we can typically see, and we see a lot of facilities that uh, probably have some areas that that need to be identified and addressed with that. Our next emphasis area: hazard communication. Uh, I think we all know what hazard communication is. Um, basically, that is a requirement that every employer uh, needs to identify the hazards of the, the chemicals or hazardous materials that people are working with. Uh, if they don't provide that information, employees have the right to refuse to work with that material. That's kind of it in a nutshell. We provide that information by providing safety data sheets to our people. <clears throat> um, we could, we're we required to keep a chemical inventory so we know what we have. And when we're in a, uh, uh, an environment where we might have facilities operations. We have a lot of industrial chemicals, cleaners, solvents, uh, uh, other materials that we work with uh, for those workers. The other side of the coin is uh, we'll probably have some research labs, chemistry labs, biology labs that have hazardous materials as well. And these are typically addressed uh, through a combination of a hazard communication plan for non-lab areas and what's called a chemical hygiene plan for laboratory areas. Uh, they're somewhat similar. Um, they both require that we have a, a good chemical inventory, we have safety data sheets, and we have a means to communicate to folks uh, the information on those sheets 
And in a lab environment, we want to make sure that folks understand how to read the sheets, they understand uh, how to interpret the information on that. OSHA had about 4,500 violations last year of the Hazard Communication Act, and it is a very common issue that we see whenever OSHA comes out uh, to a facility. They're always going to look at uh, your safety data sheets, how are you communicating that information to people, what kind of training are you giving to folks. <clears throat> and again, this uh, basically just says chemical manufacturers or imported or importers uh, need to classify the hazards of their chemicals. Uh, they need to provide that information in the form of a safety data sheet. And as an employer, we need to develop a means or a mechanism to communicate that information to our people who are, uh, who are using those chemicals. <clears throat> we do it through a uh, chemical inventory, a listing of our hazardous chemicals, and a system uh, to communicate the hazard. And if we're doing a non-routine task, say on, in a facilities environment, uh, I may be uh, uh, doing some construction, I might be uh, swapping out some equipment, I might be cleaning some, some vessels or machinery, something that doesn't typically happen that wouldn't be necessarily in my routine training. I need to make sure that I've communicated those hazards uh, to my people as well. These programs need to be written, program needs to be made available upon a request to employees, and if we have employees who are uh, working at different locations, uh, different geographical locations, we're allowed to have one hazard communication program at our primary facility as long as people have access to that. Scaffolding, and again, uh, we're seeing a fair amount of work at height and uh, fall protection requirements. Uh, scaffolding is uh, a pretty popular topic for OSHA, about 3,300 violations. Uh, in 2018 for that. We use scaffolding pretty much everywhere we have some construction going on. So that is a, a topic um, that we need to be concerned with. Typically scaffolding is going to be erected by a subcontractor, uh, someone working at the site, but under the OSHA multi-employee workplace uh, doctrine, um, as the uh, controlling uh, entity, uh, we can be held responsible as well if scaffolding isn't erected properly, maintained properly, and, and used properly. Some other types of scaffolding that might be used on a more routine basis could be a suspended scaffold. Uh, we use these for high-rise buildings, typically for window washing, and uh, a very common application. Uh, supported scaffolds, this is a, a typical construction scaffolding, uh, needs to be designed uh, and maintained by uh, competent personnel. You wouldn't think of it, but aerial lifts uh, are also considered by OSHA to be a form of scaffolding. And they can be scissor lifts, they can be mobile lifts. Um, we have some different rules for operating these. Uh, a very common type of injury that we see is if someone's on an extern exterior aerial lift, a mobile lift, um, it gets struck by a vehicle and the person in the bucket uh, can get ejected from the lift and that's a very common uh, type of injury. A lot of them are very serious and even fatalities. So typically for those types of lifts, you'd wanna have a person in a harness and clipped in. For an internal scissor lift, uh, not necessarily, the person doesn't necessarily need to be clipped into that uh, as long as there's no uh, chance for a vehicular impact uh, but we do need to have a standard rail system to protect that person from falling. <clears throat> Respirators, respiratory protection is uh, another popular type of a violation from OSHA. Uh, again, over 3,000 violations uh, for respiratory protection. Now, a respiratory protection program triggers uh, a few other requirements under OSHA. If my employee is working in an environment where he or she is exposed to a, a chemical, a mist, a dust, a fume uh, at a level where it may be above the allowable limit and there's no other means to provide you know, protection or remove that employee from the exposure, then we need to put that employee in a respirator um, 
once we, in order to do that though, the requirement is that we have a written program, we have a designated respiratory protection program coordinator, uh, we conduct uh, an exposure assessment so we know how much of whatever it is in the air we need to uh, be protecting our employee from so we can select the right respirator. <clears throat> we need to make sure that each employee is medically qualified to wear that respirator and we can, that can be done through uh, uh, OSHA has a medical approval questionnaire that can be filled out, reviewed by a medical professional. Um, in many cases that is enough to qualify the person medically if there are some questions raised through that questionnaire. Uh, we may need to send that employee off to see a, a nurse practitioner or a physician uh, to get them evaluated. Once they're medically qualified, uh, we need to select a respirator that's appropriate for the material that we're protecting them against. We need to fit test that, that respirator, which means we put the respirator on the person and we test it uh, either by exposing them to uh, an irritant uh, mist or uh, a sweet tasting uh, aerosol uh, to see if it leaks or we could do a quantit what's called a quantitative test and actually measure the leakage for that respirator. So it can be a fairly, uh, I, won't, I won't say complicated program, but it can be a fairly detailed program to make sure that we have people in the right respirator. And then everyone needs to be trained on how to uh, put the respirator on, take it off properly, maintain the respirator, and change out those, those cartridges. Uh, violations for respiratory protection are usually um, lack of a written program, inadequate training. Um, and in a lot of cases, employees will go to some place like a, a Lowe's or a Home Depot, pick up a respirator uh, or a dust mask and wear it without any type of uh, training or, or supervision. So those are some of, the, some of the issues that we do see. Lockout tagout, this is uh, basically the, a program to, to prevent the unexpected startup or, or uh, actual uh, uh, the term is uh, actualization of a machine. Uh, so it starts up unexpectedly when you're trying to work on it, almost 3,000 violations for that. And this OSHA standard covers the servicing and maintenance of, of machines and equipment um, in which an unexpected startup uh, or release of stored energy could harm someone. So if I'm working on a, could be almost anything, could be a, a drive motor, could be an HVAC fan, could be a, uh, a pump, uh, could be an agitator. If I'm working on that piece of equipment and the startup or the, uh, uh, the switch to turn it on is some distance away from that piece of equipment and it hasn't been locked out or tagged out, uh, I don't want that. I don't want someone else coming around and starting up that, that piece of equipment uh, to potentially harm someone. The way to prevent that is for each piece of equipment that has more than one energy input. So if I have a, uh, say a machining center and I've got uh, 480 volts coming in, I've got 115 volts coming in, I got uh, compressed air coming in. If I have more than one energy source for that piece of equipment, I have to have a written procedure, um, a written ener energy control procedure that identifies uh, how I shut it off, how I release any stored energy, and how I prevent the unexpected startup. If it's a cord and plug piece of equipment and the plug is in my possession or under my control, uh, I don't need to have uh, a written procedure for that. So we want to make sure that uh, before we work on any piece of equipment with multiple energy inputs, we do have that, that written procedure. OSHA requires that uh, we write that procedure and that we also audit uh, those procedures on an annual basis to make sure that they're still adequate and appropriate. OSHA does allow tag out only in certain cases where the equipment cannot be locked out. So we, we do have some, uh, some ability with that. Uh, OSHA requires that all personnel who apply a lock or a tag receive specific lockout tag out training and other people who could be uh, uh, in the area or affected 
by the lockout tagout need uh, awareness training as well. So two levels of training um, for the affected people and the authorized people and written procedures for the equipment that we're, we're going to be servicing or locking out. And basically, uh, as I said, the procedures uh, shall outline the scope, purpose, authorization uh, method that we're going to control the hazardous energy and how are we going to uh, enforce the, the use of it. So we'll have specific steps for shutting down uh, and for restarting that piece of equipment. And lockout tagout is, uh, of, of all the standards that we deal with, uh, lockout tagout is probably one of the more uh, labor intensive ones uh, to be in compliance with. It means we, we need to look at each piece of equipment that we're going to be servicing. Uh, we need to write an energy control procedure. We need to train people to those procedures and we need to keep those procedures updated. So uh, we spend a fair amount of time uh, with a number of our clients uh, helping them with, with their uh, energy control procedures. It can be a fairly, uh, a fairly large undertaking, especially if you have a big uh, mechanical uh, operation, multiple machine rooms, you know, a lot of equipment. So uh, it is, it is, and it is a, uh, uh, a regularly enforced OSHA requirement. For ladders, who would think a simple ladder would, would cause so many violations? Uh, basically, ladders, uh, step ladders, straight ladders, combination uh, or extension ladders are one of the leading causes of, of occupational fatalities and injuries. And I think everyone has seen somebody using a ladder improperly, uh, standing at the top of a step ladder, um, using a, a straight ladder to try to get up onto a roof when the straight ladder doesn't really go high enough. Um, OSHA updated its rules in 2016 and consolidated a number of its regulations for uh, portable ladders, wood ladders, fixed ladders under, under one ladder standard. And as a part of that, it makes it a bit easier to look at the rules for ladders. But anyone using the ladder should get some basic training on the types of ladders, what ladder is appropriate for what type of use, uh, and how to maintain ladders and how to inspect ladders. We don't have to do documented inspections of ladders, but a ladder should be uh, inspected each time prior to its use. And if it's not suitable for, for use, it's got a, a cracked leg, it's got a broken rung, uh, it should be taken out of service. Powered industrial trucks, everybody's favorite. Uh, these include uh, fork trucks, these include uh, material handling equipment, these even include, um, it's any kind of a mobile power propelled truck that can carry push pull stack or tier materials. So if I've got my little uh, uh, six wheeled gator or whatever we call for hauling stuff around the campus, uh, that can be, fit the definition as a powered industrial truck, which need, means we need to uh, train our users um, and they need to be trained at least once every three years uh, and certified as being qualified to operate that, that vehicle. Powered industrial vehicles need to be uh, inspected on a daily basis uh, prior to use. Uh, we don't have to document those inspections, but we, we do need to know that the, uh, the vehicle is in good shape and capable of doing its job. Uh, the training for operators should include a classroom session, which basically goes over our rules um, and regulations for safe vehicle operation, speed limits, uh, caution people uh, not to carry passengers if the vehicle's not designed to do that. And then each employer needs to put the employee uh, through a practical exercise, typically a road test, to make sure that they're, they're qualified and they're capable of operating that, that vehicle. And like I said earlier, this needs to be uh, done at least once every three years. A number of uh, our clients will have basically almost an annual uh, rodeo where uh, folks will come out if they're on their three-year cycle. Uh, 
we'll uh, run them through a classroom training session, and uh, then you can have a road test. And uh, these are typically pretty popular among workers. They, they kind of enjoy it and uh, uh, like to kind of show their, their uh, expertise at operating vehicles uh, in front of their fellow workers. So we can, we can have a little bit of fun with these things. Fall protection. Uh, you can see um, OSHA um, is, is really picking up on fall protection. We have uh, general requirements for fall protection, scaffolding, uh, ladders. Uh, OSHA um, is citing some specific uh, training requirements for fall protection and almost 2,000 violations for that. And for fall protection, you might say, well, how do I train somebody for, for fall protection? Well, if it's uh, if we're using uh, uh, lanyards and fall restraint devices and and uh, harnesses, uh, people need, need to be trained on how to put them on, how to take them off, how to inspect them, how to uh, use them. Uh, the training can be uh, very flexible. Um, we can use uh, classroom training, audiovisual demonstrations. A lot of people will, will do training in the field, uh, show people how to put, put a harness on, how to inspect uh, lanyards, how to inspect fall, pre fall prevention or fall restraint devices. Uh, and as long as the training is done by a qualified person, uh, it can be just a, a supervisor uh, who's had you know, adequate training and experience to be able to do that, that, uh, that works. One, one key piece of training for fall protection is there has to be a way for a qualified person to be available to answer questions. So if I have questions about my fall protection during my training, uh, there has to be a way for me to ask questions and get and get an answer to that. Machine guarding. I think we all know, uh, we have all seen some instances of uh, sprockets, gears, belts, fans, pulleys that uh, are inadequate, inadequately guarded and uh, 2,200 violations in 2018 for that. Uh, very, very common is uh, uh, fans, belts, pulleys, chains. Uh, they need to be guarded uh, so that we can't get a uh, uh, basically a, a finger or a hand or an arm in there while we're working on that. Very, very common is someone will go to service a piece of equipment or a machine uh, they'll take off the guards to expose the fan, the belt, the pulley, the motor, whatever, and then not put the guard back in place. And what can happen, uh, amputations uh, are, are not uncommon um, with uh, someone getting a finger or a hand in a, in a belt or a pulley. We also see people are using uh, water jets, uh, other devices, um, uh, some metal working machinery, lay the drill presses, et cetera. And we need to make sure that all the rotating parts are properly, properly evaluated and guarded. There are a number of tools uh, available on the internet. There's uh, uh, one company that, that publishes for free uh, machine tool uh, guarding assessment um, worksheets that, that is very, very useful. So, uh, you know, if you uh, are interested in that, we could uh, send us a, your email. You know, we could send you some information for that as well. But a lot of lot of good, readily available information out there, and uh, we just want to prevent those types of injuries from hand from happening. <clears throat> ANSI B11 is the uh, source of uh, of machine guarding standards within industry. Uh, you should note that what OSHA has on its books for uh, requirements for machine guarding is pretty dated, so uh, you'd want to look at the more most recent ANSI B11 series of standards, uh, and that will that will give you the state of the art for how how best to guard uh, machine tools and rotating equipment. And then finally, personal protective equipment. 1,500 plus violations for personal protective equipment under OSHA. Uh, in 2018. Oops, let me back up a little bit. OSHA has 
a requirement not only to provide appropriate personal protective equipment and common types of personal pr protective equipment um, in most industrial environments or most uh, laboratory environments are going to be what you think it is. Uh, if I'm in a, an area where I'm working with, with chemicals, hazardous materials, I need some kind of body protection uh, in a laboratory that's going to be a lab coat. Typically, I'll need eye or face protection, so safety glasses if I have potential for a splash hazard, a face shield, and then uh, hand protection. Uh, gloves can be disposable gloves in a lab, can be uh, leather work gloves um, in a shop environment. Uh, for welding, obviously, we'd need uh, you know, body protection, welding gloves, uh, you know, uh, basically a welding helmet if we're working there. OSHA requires wherever we're providing personal protective equipment for our employees that we do a, a personal protective equipment hazard assessment. And this is a, a common omission that we see in a number of places, but wherever I have a group or people working and I'm providing them with PPE, I need to have that backed up by my PPE hazard assessment, which is a written document that identifies what the hazard is, uh, what the body parts involved are, uh, what the personal protective equipment is that is appropriate for that hazard. Uh, these assessments need to be uh, documented and they need to be signed and dated by a qualified person uh, who's done the assessment. So if I'm giving someone safety glasses and a hard hat, say, I should have my PPE hazard assessment um, that made the determination of why I'm uh, requiring that hard hat or why I'm requiring those safety glasses. So that is something to keep in mind if, if we're giving, uh, giving folks uh, personal protective equipment. And if I'm wearing personal protective equipment, um, my employer needs to make sure that I am properly trained um, on how to put it on, how to take it off, um, how to maintain it. If it's something really basic like a hard hat or safety glasses, just a quick demonstration. Hey, this is how you put it on, adjust it, uh, et cetera. Uh, other types of PPE like respirators uh, can be a bit more complicated or uh, fall protection equipment. The training component can be a little bit more complicated for that. So that is uh, our PPE summary. All right, now that we've looked at all of these OSHA regulatory requirements um, and the, the issues that uh, people can have in, in just staying on top of them, staying in compliance. <clears throat> how do we improve our, our OSHA programs? Uh, it's basically safety 101. Um, it's the old, uh, the old bromide. What gets measured gets managed. So we need management to set appropriate safety policies and procedures. Uh, Safety policies and procedures should be should be practical. They should be effective. They should be common sense. Um, what we should train our employees as soon as they're hired as to what our safety procedures and policies are. Uh, we need to really focus on safe work practices and behaviors. It's the habits that we need to be focusing on. We need to have people in a su supervisory role uh, and co-workers trained to, we, we don't want to be catching people doing unsafe things, but we want to be observant. We want to make sure that if we see someone doing something unsafe, then we take some steps uh, to remind them, to coach them um, on how to, uh, you know, get back into a safe mode. And we need to conduct inspections to find safety problems uh, and then correct them. And our inspections really should be focused as much on behavior and practices as they are on the things, you know, the uh, you know the uninspected fire extinguisher or the hole in the floor. Uh, we need to find, we need to be identifying unsafe habits and work practices as well, and and coaching our folks to uh, to change them. So, in in summary, we talked a little bit about. You know, OSHA and its regulatory rulemaking. Um, we talked about our top 10 regulatory compliance issues, and year after year after year, this has been very, very consistent. It's, it's fall protection, it's chemical safety, it's personal protective equipment, 
its uh, guarding of tools and equipment. That is a very, very consistent theme. And then to make sure that we are getting our folks in compliance and keeping people safe, we need to have a clear strategy. And clear strategy to me means having a, a clear, uh, easily uh, explained or easily, easily uh, pointed out safety philosophy. Uh, we need to be consistent on how we enforce the rules. We need to be consistent on identifying uh, safe behavior versus unsafe behavior. And as part of that strategy, we need feedback. So we need to have data, uh, typically in the form of inspections or observations that we can look at trends and based on those trends, and then we, we, we can be making some changes to our, to our programs. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Nita and uh, see how we want to handle questions. Great. Thanks, Mark. That was a lot of really great information. Um, I know we've gotten a lot of questions come in so far, so let's jump right into it. Excellent. Do you have the inspection or do the inspection slash citation numbers that you included in the slides include state OSHA numbers as well as federal OSHA, or are they only federal OSHA numbers? No, these are these are only federal OSHA. So, uh, you know, the uh, we 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 didn't roll up state numbers in that. So this is only federal OSHA. Great, thanks, Mark. Do you have to provide fall protection when using a ten foot ladder, and how would that even be possible? Uh, typically, no, and, and this, this can be a kind of a complicated rule, but basically, uh, if you're on a ladder and the ladder is less than, I'd have to double check, the 20 or 22 feet, uh, typically, you don't have to provide fall protection, and there's some, uh, you know, you can, you can Google some, some good information on that, but typ typically, no, the ladder in itself is, is going to help you. Thanks, Mark. Is there an OSHA requirement to wear fall, a fall protection harness while working inside the bucket of a properly maintained scissor lift? I, I believe the answer to that is no, if it's inside the building. Great, thanks. Yeah. Does the uh, power uh, does, oops, sorry, yeah, what? Sorry, just to back up on the bucket, the scissor yep. lift, but the scissor lift does need to have the standard railing, you know, for fall protection. So we, we do need to have the, the railing for that. Yes. Which most of, most of them are built with. Yes, perfect. Does the powered industrial truck standard include golf carts and does it matter if it's battery or gas? That's a good question. It depends on who's operating the golf cart. Um, you know, I would, I would, uh, I think I'll look that one up. Or, or call my local OSHA area office. Thanks, Mark. Sean, we'll, we can get back to you with a little more information. Um, yeah, once and, uh, uh, yeah, I wasn't, uh, that, that, that is a good one. That is a good one. Um, I think in some circumstances it could be, but um, if it's an employee and they're using the vehicle to transport any kind of material, uh, I guess golf material, you know, clubs or whatever could be. But no, that's that's a good one. We'll, we'll make a call. We'll get back to you in a minute. Thanks, Mark. Um, what are the top violations for pits? For excuse me. For PIT for PITs. Powered. Um, what what's the PIT? Powered industrial trucks. <clears throat> yeah, I would say uh, basically it's training and inspection on powered indu industrial trucks. Thanks. Um, would a UTV be covered under the powered industrial truck category? and would ride on cleaning equipment, auto floor scrubber, scrubbers, et cetera, also be covered in this category? I think typically no, but again, we're gonna make a list of, of those and we'll get some clarification from our, from our local OSHA guys. And those are really good questions. They're, they're not transporting a load, they're transporting a person, but I will, uh, we, we will double check. Can a fall harness be recertified if it's in good condition but out of date? It would need to be recertified by uh, the manufacturer or an authorized manufacturer's rep. Okay, thanks. Um, did I understand you right in that if 
you only have one source of energy, you don't need a lockout tagout procedure for that piece of equipment? You don't need a written procedure, yes. And that would be a, a typically cord and plug, or if you have, say, a, a single uh, knife switch, electrical, um, you know, that, that you can lock out, then you do not need a, a written procedure for that. It's only if you have more than one energy input. Thanks, Mark. Is it, is it a mandatory requirement for state universities to have safety programs in place, such as machine guarding, PPE, and fall protection? <clears throat> I would say so, because if you're not covered under federal OSHA, you should be covered by an equivalent state program. Uh, we've seen a lot of state programs really don't do a lot on the enforcement end, uh, but the, the answer is yes, but then uh, you, you may not see very vigorous enforcement in some areas. And there's also, uh, the, you have the regulatory compliance piece, but don't forget the liability piece. If someone is injured, um, because you failed to implement basic and, and regulatory required programs that puts you in a bad situation from a, from a legal liability standpoint. Is four foot the max height without a body harness? How should we handle climbing ladders above four feet? Oh, there's a whole, yeah, within the ladders, that's a whole separate, uh, that's a whole separate Thing. You can go um, more than four feet on a ladder without fall protection. We'll, we'll put a little uh, clarification together on that for you guys as well. Could you expand on the concepts of liability and due diligence from an organizational perspective for roles and responsibilities and accountability levels of individuals subject to OSHA regulations? Boy, that's a, that's a good question. Um, we could probably have a whole webinar on that, get a couple of attorneys in to talk about it. But, uh, but basically, as the employer, uh, we're obligated to provide a, a safe working environment for our people. Um, a couple of things can happen. Um, if, we're, if we're not in compliance with either state or federal OSHA uh, for, our, you know, for our workplace, we can get fined, we can get cited. Um, if someone's injured, then in addition to those uh, fines and penalties, uh, we, can, we can be held uh, civilly liable and uh, basically families of injured workers, things like that. Uh, we can have those types of lawsuits uh, against us. And finally, and I think you see it in the news uh, when there's a big uh, industrial accident with fatalities or a construction accident with fatalities, uh, the the uh, uh, the authorities can can come after us for uh, criminal acts. They can uh, uh, basically charge us for you know manslaughter or even worse. So th there's a lot of liability, you know, that just revolves around the whole thing. But ultimately, you know, it's the senior leadership, senior management that is is ultimately responsible, and it basically should flow down through the organization. Thanks, Mark. What are common citations for loading docks? Oh boy, loading docks. We got uh, railings. Um, typically, you can have have railings. Uh, you can have inadequate lighting. Uh, you can have uh, failure to have wheel chocks to enforce the use of wheel chocks for trucks that are coming in and out. Um, if you have a loading dock and you have a fork truck going on and off the truck, the uh, the uh, the ramps themselves. Uh, we can have have issues with, but typically it's it's going to be housekeeping, it's going to be railings, it's it's going to be uh, you know illumination and walking and working surfaces. Thanks, Mark. This is kind of a broader question, but can you highlight some strategies to improve and make sure that you are staying compliant with these violations or with these programs so that you're not in violation? That, you know, we're getting some good questions today, Nita, I'm telling you. I think the best, the best way to maintain compliance is you need to have everybody on board with the program uh, from your senior people through every level of the organization. That doesn't mean that the president of a university needs to know OSHA in and out, 
but that person should should satisfy themselves that I've got people who are who are uh, doing inspections uh, that are doing program evaluations that I'm getting the data I need for that and then even at the most senior level uh, folks should be able to to walk through any part of their organization and if something doesn't look quite right they should be asking the question you know why doesn't this look right or or how should I be doing that but basically it's it's establishing policy it's establishing a, a means for for getting program status feedback on a meaningful level it's a make sure we have a, a means to train our people at the appropriate level uh, of what they need to be doing um, it's it's a system it's it's a you know, a system of of uh, setting policy, uh, measuring results, correcting problems, and having a way a feedback loop for that. It, it's really your plan, do, check, act cycle. If for for those of you who are familiar with some of the quality uh, some of the quality uh, criteria. Thanks, Mark. We definitely are getting some really good questions today. Um, do you have to tie off a sixteen foot step ladder? I would say typically no, but we'll put a we'll put a ladder. Uh, you know, we'll we'll get some some ladder uh, info for you guys. It's usually 20 or 22 feet if I'm recalling it right, but I don't want to say anything unless I've, I've double checked it. So, thanks, Mark. Can SDS sheets be made available electronically, or do you need to have a paper copy? Oh, you bet. Electronic is is uh, the way to go. They just have to be readily accessible. And typically, if you can get your hands on them within, you know, 15 minutes or so, that that should that should suit the bill. But electronic is fine. Can you define competent person and what minimum training slash records and experience are required to qualify someone as competent? There's different different definitions, and I'm I'm assuming this is going back to the uh, uh, kind of the ladder and scaffold uh, discussion uh, within the ANSI standard. They define a competent person. It's usually competent by training or experience, and a lot of times these terms are, are fairly loosely defined. But I would go back to the actual regulation, uh, or back to the uh, the ANSI B11 standard, you know, to get the criteria for that. It's a combination of of training and experience, and again, these definitions can be a bit fuzzy. Uh, typically, a professional engineer would be considered a competent person in in most areas a certified safety professional would also be considered a competent person uh, in, in most cases. Thanks Mark. Should boots be provided for custodial folks who deal with overflowing toilets and ur or urinals? <laughs> uh, I, I would <clears throat> I would say if there's any potential you know to get your feet wet uh, with something that's that's a uh, uh, a biohazardous material or agent, agent, we should have appropriate footwear for that. But uh, all this should be based on a risk assessment. We should, we should, uh, uh, as with all personal protective equipment, uh, we should conduct our PPE hazard assessment, see exactly what the hazards are, uh, what the potential for injury is, and then based on that, make our determination as to what is uh, appropriate. Thanks, Mark. Um, are there templates or resources available for creating safety inspections? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's a ton of stuff out there. In fact, there's almost too much out there. Um, there. Um, I'm trying to think of a good. If I were going to re be recreating or creating some safety inspection forms, uh, you can go a lot of uh, a lot of universities. Uh, and institutions have, have really published some very good uh, safety manuals on the internet. A lot of that's readily available. Uh, if you can let us know maybe a little more specifically what it is you're looking for, we could we could give you a little more pointed answer, I would say. Um, going back to the question about a harness on a scissor lift, do you have to wear a harness if you're on a vertical lift bucket? Uh, it, it's going to be... Yeah, you know, the, the question about harnesses on, on buckets and vertical lifts always comes up. Um, these are typically provided with, with tie-off points from the manufacturer. 
And I, I would say uh, we should base it on risk assessment primarily. Uh, and again, the reason for tying someone into a bucket on a hoist or a lift would be, is there any potential for that person to be ejected from that bucket or lift if it's struck by something? Or uh, is it a lift that does not have a complete uh, rail system to prevent you from falling out? But, but I'll default, because you know, there's a lot of different circumstances that, that we could use these in, um, and, and say, generally, people will, will wear a harness and be tied off in a bucket. But based on risk assessment, we may not need to do that. Thanks, Mark. Um, would an air handling unit with a belt system pulley fall under machine hazard? Uh, yeah, from a from a machine guarding standpoint, and typically, if if the the uh, exposed belt and pulley is is uh, less than seven feet from the deck or, or from the floor, it's considered to be accessible. So we can we can guard machinery and equipment and equipment by location say if it's eight feet off the floor we may not need to guard that but if it's something that you pull a panel uh, or it's exposed during normal operation now when i'm servicing an each piece of hvac equipment and i pull the panels the panel is my guard and i can have that pulley or belt exposed at that point in time thanks mark um, does a worksheet or hazard assessment need to be signed every time PPE is handed out? No, no, it's a, it's really a one-time PPE hazard assessment that we need to keep on file. And if uh, conditions change or the PPE is changed, then we need to update our PPE hazard assessment. Great. Um, how about shoring? What's the requirement before shoring is needed? Oh boy, that's a, that's, that's a construction safety issue and it depends on the type of trenching and the soils um, I, <clears throat> excuse me and again if you can give us a more specific example we have uh, uh, one of our one of our colleagues is a civil engineer who specializes in construction safety and he could uh, he could point uh, we'll make sure we point you in the right direction thanks mark do you have a suggested company that I can use for comprehensive safety trainings for my managers? I don't know, Nita, to be self-serving. What do you think? Should we? <laughs> I mean. <laughs> we, 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 actually, we, we actually do a lot of that, but I, I don't want to be, you know, getting into shameless uh, marketing here. We'll do marketing, but not shameless marketing. Do agree with not doing shameless marketing. Um, <laughs> Did I understand you correctly that you can utilize an attendant for sole means of fall protection on a flat roof? Yep, and, and before you do that, I'd, I'd make sure I, I go through and read uh, the OSHA construction. Uh, OSHA does allow several means of uh, preventing falls, and, and one of them is to use uh, an attendant, uh, and it's appropriate for certain situations like a flat, a flat roof, but I would, I would before I jump into things, I would uh, go back and read my OSHA construction standard and I'd read some letters of interpretation uh, to make sure that, that what I'm doing is appropriate uh, for the circumstance. If you have a state OSHA, do they supersede the federal OSHA requirements? No, what uh, typically the, the rules are that that state OSHA say it's going to apply to public employees, they need to be equivalent. And you need to look at each state independently to, to see what their uh, to see what their specific standards are. Most most states will say, yeah, we're going to be equivalent to OSHA, uh, but which is good, but it tends to fall apart on the uh, inspection and enforcement front. I hate to interrupt. Wonderful question Q and A, but unfortunately, we're at the top of the hour, so I just want to thank our speaker, Mark, and our moderator, Nita, for your wonderful presentation today. And for those of you who we were not able to answer your questions, you will be, you will get an answer from Mark in, you know, within a few days or so. But again, everyone, much for the webinar today, and we look forward to next month's webinars.
Great. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye now and have a great afternoon. Yep. Take care. Bye-bye.